It seems fitting, given the wonderful surroundings of the Museum of the Order of St. John, to begin this lecture by telling a story from the 13th century that opens in the medieval hospital of St. John in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. It is a tale of lust and intrigue, of bribery and seduction, of a burdensome secret and a near fatal obsession. It is the story of a merchant who bought from a harlot the arm of St. John the Baptist. The story was originally recorded in around the year 1220 by a German Cistercian monk known as Caesarius of Heisterbach in a text entitled The Dialogue on Miracles. Caesarius gave an account of how a merchant from his locality had recently made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. While he was in the east, the merchant visited the hospital of St. John in the city of Acre, where he saw something with which he became completely captivated. The arm relic of St. John the Baptist. The merchant was determined that he should take possession of this sacred object for himself. He discovered that the hospitaller who acted as the relic's custodian had fallen in love with a local woman who it would seem had thus far spurned the hospitaller's amorous advances. The merchant therefore approached the woman with a proposal for an interesting series of transactions. If she was to consent to becoming the hospitaller's lover, the hospitaller would agree to present her with the arm of St. John as a gift. The merchant would then buy the relic from her for the sum of 140 pounds of silver. Needless to say, our monastic author, Caesarius of Heisterbach, did not approve of any of this. And here's what he had to say about it. Do you see how great a mockery, he wrote, just as long ago, the head of St. John was given by Herod to a promiscuous girl as a reward for her dancing, and by her given to her adulterous mother. So even in these days, the arm of the same saint was given to a vile woman by the hospitaller as the reward for fornication, and by her was sold to the merchant. Now note here that it's, it's the woman who's identified as the villain of the piece rather than the merchant or the hospitaller. But the story doesn't end there. Caesarius went on to describe how the merchant returned to the West with the arm of St. John, which he hid for safekeeping in the framework of a new house that he had built in his home city of Groningen. Sometime later, a great fire broke out in the city, but the merchant was unconcerned, even when the flames approached his house, because he knew that it had a good guardian within its fabric. However, his neighbours were curious about how the house had survived the fire, and they started to ask questions that the merchant found difficult to answer. As suspicions were mounting, and in a bid to keep his acquisition of the relic a secret, the merchant removed the arm from its hiding place and gave it to a local hermit. But the anxiety of this conspiracy was too much for the hermit. So she gave the relic to another individual who in turn handed it on to the people of the city. This drove the merchant to distraction and, as Caesarius put it, he begged with tears to have his property restored to him. When questioned further about where the arm had come from, the merchant pleaded ignorance, knowing that he would never get the relic back if its provenance was revealed. In his grief at the loss of the relic, the merchant eventually abandoned the city, was reduced to vagrancy, and finally became so ill that he was afraid he might die. It was only at this moment that he revealed to a confessor what the relic was and how he had obtained it. The response to the revelation about the relic's origins was dramatic, and here is Caesarius of Heisterbach again. When the citizens learned this, they made a silver gilt receptacle in the shape of an arm and adorned it with precious stones, and therein they placed the relics. Now, we don't have the reliquary surviving, but given the, uh, the date and the location from which this example was taken, I imagine it would have looked something similar to this. The reliquary itself was subsequently showcased in a newly constructed shrine in the church of St. Martin in Groningen, 
And Caesarius concluded his story by noting that since its identity had been revealed, the relic had brought about many signs and cures in that city, and that Groningen had therefore become an important centre of pilgrimage. In fact, Caesarius wrote that he had even been to the city himself to see the arm, noting that it was still clothed with flesh and skin. Caesarius of Heisterbach's story about the arm of St John the Baptist provides a valuable insight into one of the most distinctive features of medieval Latin Christianity, the cult of relics. The cult of relics centred around the veneration of objects that were believed to contain sacred power, or virtus, through which miracles and wonders might be performed. Now, the historian Ronald Finucan famously characterised this virtus as holy radioactivity. That is to say that this sacred power emanated from these objects, affecting all those that touched them and everything with which they came into contact. In Caesarius' story, it is the virtus of the arm relic of St John that prevents the merchant's house from burning to the ground, and it is this same virtus that brings about the miracles of healing following the relic's identification. Relics themselves could take a variety of forms. Among the most important and valuable relics were the physical remains of saints and other holy men and women, such as their bones, teeth, hair and blood, objects like the arm of St John the Baptist. Also included in this first class of relic were objects that had come into contact with Christ or the Virgin Mary. Some of the most celebrated relics were those associated with the Passion, such as the True Cross, the Holy Lance and the Crown of Thorns. And this is a, a wonderful example of a reliquary relating to the Crown of Thorns. Uh, it's an individual thorn from the Crown of Thorns, which is mounted centrally uh, in this sort of, beneath this dome crystal window. Here's a, a close-up shot of it. Um, the relic itself is this sort of spine here, and it's surrounded by uh, replicas of instruments of the Passion. So we see here a replica of the Holy Lance, we have a replica of the Crown of Thorns at the top, and here we have uh, one of these angels holding the nails with which Christ was affixed to the cross. A second group of relics consisted of things that had been made sacred through coming into contact with a saint while he or she was alive. This could include clothes, shoes, and other personal belongings. And the next slide is of a photo I took earlier this month in the Oxford Oratory. Uh, it's a relic, and just in the centre there, of St Bernard of Clairvaux. I think it's a piece of his white uh, Cistercian monastic habit. Related to these objects, known as uh, sorry, related to these were objects known as contact relics, consisting of more mundane things that had come into contact with a source of virtus and had thus become, in Finucane's terminology, radioactive. These could include pieces of cloth or liquids that had touched or otherwise been exposed to sacred matter of one form or another. In describing the creation of a reliquary for the arm of St. John, Caesarius of Heisterbach testified to some of the ways in which medieval Christians sought to honour and glorify these sacred treasures by manufacturing elaborate material surroundings for them. Caesarius's story about the merchant of Groningen's obsession with the relic also provides a clear illustration of the fact that relics could become objects of intense desire for medieval Latin Christians, and accounts of the theft of relics are commonplace in medieval hagiographical texts. And with this profound enthusiasm for the acquisition of sacred matter in mind, there's a final detail in Caesarius' account that exemplifies another important aspect of medieval relic theory and practice. Pars pro toto, the part represents the whole. For as the cult of the arm of St. John of Groningen became increasingly popular, Caesarius tells us that a priest from the church of St. Martin removed the relic from its reliquary housing and cut off a small piece of flesh from the arm for himself. This kind of fragmentation of the sacred 
was not deemed to be as problematic as one might anticipate because it was believed that while the object itself was divisible, the virtus within the relic remained stable, irrespective of how many times it was divided. The idea of pars pro toto was central to the development of the cult of relics because theoretically it enabled an almost infinite subdivision of this sacred matter. Relics could therefore be fragmented, distributed or given as gifts, and collections of relics from many diverse sources could be amassed. And this is just a slide of the inside of a portable altar from the late 12th century, showing just you know, dozens of small fragments of relic from many different sources. Finally, as is clear from what Cesarius tells us about the Church of St. Martin in Groningen, the shrine churches within which relics were kept could become busy centres of pilgrimage activity. Devotees would travel from near and far to offer thanksgiving or to seek the intercession of particular saints, to acquire the spiritual privileges and indulgences associated with such arduous undertakings, and of course, to see and to touch the sacred objects that were at the heart of cult activity. Among the most celebrated pilgrimage um, destinations were Canterbury for Tom, St. Thomas Becket, Rome for St. Peter and St. Paul, and Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain for St. James the Great. But none of these sites could rival what was the most important pilgrimage objective for medieval Christians, Jerusalem, and specifically the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. To get a sense of what Jerusalem and the Holy Sepulchre might have meant to medieval Christians in the period with which we are most directly concerned, we can look to three texts that were probably composed independently of one another by a trio of Benedictine monks in the first decade of the 12th century. Our first author, Robert the Monk, wrote that Jerusalem is the navel of the earth. It is a land more fruitful than any other, almost another earthly paradise. Our Redeemer dignified it with his arrival, adorned it with his words, consecrated it through his passion, redeemed it by his death, and glorified it with his burial. Our second author, Guibert of Nogent, asked, if this land is the inheritance of God, even before the Lord walked and suffered there, as the sacred and prophetic pages tell us, then what additional sanctity and reverence did it gain then, when the God of majesty took flesh upon himself there? This is the place where the blood of the Son of God holier than heaven and earth was spilled, where the body at whose death the elements trembled rested in its tomb. And for our third author, Baudric of Bourgueil, holy Jerusalem is that very city in which, as you know, Christ himself suffered for us since our sins demanded it. And in that place, God was laid to rest. There he died for us, there he was buried. How precious is that place of the Lord's burial. How desirable a place beyond compare. The pilgrimage sites of the Holy Land were therefore commemorated and venerated by these writers and so many of their contemporaries as the places that had witnessed the events of Christ's birth, life and ministry, his passion, death and resurrection. The location that was at the centre of this devotional activity was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the shrine church in the city of Jerusalem that had been constructed over the tomb where Christ's body had been buried and from which he was supposed to have risen from the dead. And yet, precisely because of that resurrection and Christ's subsequent ascension to heaven, this shrine church was distinguished from those across much of the rest of the Latin Christian world because it was empty. The cult of the Holy Sepulchre was therefore a cult of absence in a religious culture that was increasingly focused on the acquisition and veneration of sacred material presence. So how did Latin Christians of the Central Middle Ages express their devotion to an empty tomb? The material culture of the 12th and 13th centuries provides a useful starting point for our investigation. 
Here, it is evident that one approach to negotiating the tensions surrounding Christ's absent body was simply to visualise it as present. This is a 12th century ampulla, a small flask-like container for contact relics from the Holy Land that could be kept as a souvenir of pilgrimage, and it's now in the British Museum. The image depicted on the ampulla shows the three towers of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as they would have appeared to contemporaries in the 12th century. And beneath the central dome, the body of Christ is shown wrapped in a burial shroud. So we have here an anachronistic image that elides the first century burial of Christ in the sepulchre with the 12th century reality of the church that Latin Christians would have been familiar with. A similar iconography is to be found on the seals of the Grand Masters of the Order of the Hospital of St. John, and these examples all come from uh, this museum. Although there is some debate as to precisely what, or rather who and where, these seals were supposed to depict, the similarity between these images and the ones found on contemporaneous pilgrim ampullae is striking. In fact, it is plausible that the ambiguity in the imagery here was intentional. These images could either be interpreted as depictions of a patient within the hospital of St. John, and or they could show Christ's dead body within the Holy Sepulchre, thus delineating a connection between the central goal of Jerusalem pilgrims and the charitable activities of the hospitalers who provided for their welfare. When it came to addressing the issue of the absence within the Holy Sepulchre then, these images seem to announce that whilst Christ's body was not there, he was still there. Although the sepulchre was unlike most other major pilgrimage destinations, insofar as it was devoid of any bodily remains, it had been sacralised nevertheless through the presence of the body that had once rested there. The images provided visual cues for the idea that through the presence of Christ's body, the sepulchre itself had been charged with virtus. Here, therefore, there was spiritual presence in spite of material absence. Textual evidence from the early 12th century also suggests that medieval Latins were aware of the sacred power that the Holy Sepulchre was believed to contain and emit. A text called the Gesta Francorum et Aliorum Hiero Salimitanorum, the deeds of the Franks and the other Jerusalemites, was probably completed in around the year 1100 and presents a narrative account of the First Crusade about which I shall say more in due course. The Gesta offers a number of important entry points into the spirituality associated with crusading, including with reference to the virtus of the Holy Sepulchre. For example, in describing a skirmish fought outside the walls of Antioch in March 1098, the anonymous author described how the Crusaders' enemies had been defeated by the power of God and the Holy Sepulchre, and the word virtus is, is used here. Similarly, in a subsequent reflection on the outcome of the Battle of Antioch in June 1098, the Gesta's author wrote that victory had been achieved by the help of God and the Holy Sepulchre. Now, at first glance, these phrases might not seem especially noteworthy and could, be, could perhaps be disregarded as stylistic flourishes. But I'm inclined to think that the choices of words here are significant and that the guest as author was indicating his understanding of the virtus of the Holy Sepulchre. It is, it is as if the empty tomb itself was believed to be emitting holy radiation that enabled divine in intervention in the course of the crusade. In this respect, it's significant that the text's most recent editor has argued that the Gesta was probably completed in Jerusalem and possibly within the scriptorium of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre itself. This would certainly explain the addition of the three appendices that are included in the earliest surviving version of the text, which dates from the early 12th century. So the first of these appendices is an itinerary of the holy places. 
The second is a mass in honour of the Holy Sepulchre. But the most intriguing for our concerns is the third of these appendices. And this captures, I think, another attempt by medieval Latins to address the absence of Christ's body from the Holy Sepulchre by giving it a kind of imagined material presence. So, the third appendix consists of a pair of line drawings. The first of these is 129 millimetres in length, and the translation of the caption here is, this line, taken from the sepulchre of the Lord in Jerusalem and multiplied 15 times, marks out the height of Christ. On the day on which you see it, you will not suffer sudden death. The second line, which is 98 millimetres in length, has a similar caption. This second line, multiplied nine times, marks out the breadth of Christ, and it gives the same protection against sudden death on the day on which it has once been seen. So on this basis, Christ was supposed to have been about 1.94 metres tall, about six foot four, so about my height, uh, and about 88 centimetres wide, which is slightly, slightly wider than me. I think it's probably about that wide. Um, a similar pair of line drawings can be found in a 14th century English manuscript copy of the Gesta Francorum, which is now in Gonville and Keyes College Library in Cambridge. And here's the detail. Here, the narrative of the First Crusade again concludes with an itinerary of the holy places, the mass in honour of the sepulchre, and a pair of line drawings. Here, the first line, multiplied 15 times, indicates the length of the sepulchre of the Lord, while the second line, multiplied nine times, indicates the length of the same sepulchre. And it's likely that the lines were copied from that last manuscript into the huge miscellany from Glastonbury Abbey, that's now in Cambridge University Library. It's a huge manuscript about this big. And there are near identical lines and captions uh, in this manuscript. Now, it's striking how the, mean, the descriptions of the meanings of these lines change <coughs> over time. So in this earliest surviving manuscript, uh, the lines are said to mark out the height and width of Christ's actual body, measurements that have been calculated on the basis of the dimensions of the Holy Sepulchre. In the later copies, the distinction between Christ and the tomb has been collapsed, simply to provide the measurements of the sepulchre itself, rather than the body that lay within it. More striking still is the fact that in the earliest manuscript, catching sight of these lines is described as having something akin to a miraculous effect on the viewer, a statement that is conspicuous by its absence from the later copies. This suggests that our 12th century scribe believed that the manuscript itself contained some of the virtus of the Holy Sepulchre, sacred power that had been transmitted from the tomb to the page. If the origins of the Gesta's transmission are to be located in Jerusalem, it's possible that these early manuscripts of the text might themselves have been regarded as sacred objects, a kind of textual contact relic that had been created through their association with the Holy Sepulchre. And just to provide a bit of context here, um, in a really important recent book on late medieval uh, devotional ideas, Caroline Walker Bynum has argued that later medieval attempts to record Christ's bodily measurements um, have power. An accurate measure of the, those bodily me measure of those bodily measurements has gives the image power. And one of the examples she gives uh, is this woodcut. Uh, from 1490. And this uh, sort of inscription here gives the kind of instructions of what you're supposed to do with relation to this uh, image of the cross in the middle. Uh, it says that if you multiply the central image of the cross by a factor of 40, it will make the length of Christ in his humanity. And that, quote, whoever kisses it with devotion shall be protected from sudden death or misfortune. So Bynum suggests that to measure is to absorb something of the power of the measured self by contact with it. And she goes on to write, cords or lines that measured Christ's length 
brought devotees into the presence of his departed body and were thought to carry the power of the original object with them. This would appear to be precisely what we are witnessing in this early version of the Gesta Francorum. This manuscript not only brought its readers into the presence of Christ's absent body through the act of measurement and reproduction, but it also captured the transfer of virtus from his body to the manuscript through the medium of the Holy Sepulchre. Although the Holy Sepulchre was an empty tomb, there is therefore a variety of evidence from the 12th and 13th centuries to indicate that it was understood to be a significant repository of sacred power. Indeed, it's perhaps best to think of the whole church as constituting one big contact relic that was radiating with virtus. With this in mind, and remembering both the obvious contemporary enthusiasm for the acquisition of sacred matter and the related principle of pars pro toto, the part represents the whole, it's not surprising that pilgrims to the sepulchre and other medieval Latins sought to obtain sacred souvenirs of this empty tomb. Among the objects they sought to take possession of were pieces of rock from the sepulchre itself. A late 11th century inventory of the relics that were held in the chapel of St. Lawrence in the Lateran Palace in Rome includes references to the rock on which the Lord was buried, the rock upon which the angel sat at the sepulchre, and simply a relic from the Lord's sepulchre. Similarly, this late 12th century French reliquary cross brought together a number of relics from the Holy Land, including a piece of the true cross. And, as is evident from the inscription engraved on the right-hand side of the shaft of the reliquary, it's a relic that had come de sepulcro domini, from the sepulchre of the Lord. One of the most striking accounts of the lengths Jerusalem pilgrims may have gone to in acquiring these relics relates to Count Fulk III Nora of Anjou, who made at least three pilgrimages to Jerusalem prior to his death in 1040. In a text known as the Chronicle of the Deeds of the Counts of Anjou, which is likely to date from the early 12th century, Fulk's pilgrimage of 1035 is described in extensive detail. The chronicle refers to the hardships Fulk endured on the journey to the Holy Land, the obstacles he had to overcome, and eventually the joy he experienced at being able to venerate at the Holy Sepulchre. While he was there, Fulk supposedly seized the miraculous opportunity with which he was presented. He, Fulk, prayed with a flow of many tears. Soon he sensed that a divine command turned soft the hardness of the stone, and the Count, kissing the tomb, tore off a big piece with his teeth and hid it. He took it away with him. Not all relics of the sepulchre were acquired in circumstances as dramatic as these, and many Jerusalem pilgrims may have obtained little more than a few scrapings of rock or fragments of stone dust as souvenirs of their journey. Any modern visitor to the church cannot help but be struck by the number of signs of the cross that are engraved in the building's walls. Although it is obviously difficult to date these crosses with any precision, Colin Morris has suggested that they, may, they were made mostly by pilgrims in the 12th century. The practice that lies behind these crosses has often been interpreted as providing a way for devotees to leave a mark of their pilgrimage, to stake a personal claim in the church by leaving a hand-carved symbol of the passion that amounts to a form of devotional graffiti. But one material byproduct of this practice, through which medieval pilgrims fashioned the presence of a cross by manufacturing absence within the stone from which it was carved, would have been the creation of new relics. Modest though these fragments of stone may have been, they were all still theoretically infused with virtus, and it's not difficult to imagine them being meticulously collected and carried homewards, as is known to have happened with tomb dust at other medieval pilgrimage shrines. 
In a similar vein, one can also imagine pilgrims taking things with them to the sepulchre to create new contact relics by bringing their objects into contact with it. Now, this photograph, uh, again, was taken earlier this month in the Oxford Oratory. Um, and while the relic depicted here almost certainly does not date from the Middle Ages, the process that the label indicates led to its creation is reminiscent of medieval practices. I'm not sure if you can all read that, but there's a label saying, Crown of Thorns, having touched the sepulchre of our Lord in Jerusalem. So here, a miniaturised crown of thorns has been brought into contact with the Holy Sepulchre and is thus believed to have been permeated with virtus. Now, as this photograph indicates, the acquisition of relics of the Holy Sepulchre is not just a medieval phenomenon. Indeed, one of our most unexpected discoveries here at the Museum of the Order of St John has been two fragments of rock that appear to have originated from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So here's the first one. Uh, it's a small fragment of rock. I don't know if you can all see this, but it says, fragment of the original corner of the church, with no R, of the stone Holy Sepulchre, the gift of major, and then it becomes blurred here, as does the date. Um, and the second fragment has a printed label, again demonstrating uh, its provenance from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, the donor of this second object, identified by the label as Major Edward Keith Roach, was governor of Jerusalem between 1926 and 1945 during the period of the British Mandate. Now, it's unclear whether these stones were acquired as acts of devotion, but even if secularised, the acquisitions can still be placed in a continuum with the medieval examples I have already discussed. For my own part, uh, among the objects I purchased on a research trip to Jerusalem in December uh, 2014 was this modern reliquary souvenir. And in many respects, this object is analogous to the 12th century ampulla I have already described. Like the medieval ampullae, these are low-cost, mass-produced items that are, des are designed to respond to the needs of travellers and pilgrims in search of an inexpensive memento of their visit to Jerusalem. Also like their medieval counterparts, these objects purport to contain a variety of forms of contact relic, in this case including holy water from the River Jordan, holy oil from Bethlehem, and holy soil from Jerusalem. And again, I'm not sure if you can read this, but there's a, at the bottom here it says, Certificate of Authenticity. This is to certify that this sacred object contains pure water from the Jordan River, genuine earth from Jerusalem, virgin olive oil from Bethlehem, frankincense, and olive wood cross from the Holy Land. Now, in both medieval and modern examples, the origins and significance of their contents is announced through their material surroundings, which delineate a direct connection with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This continuum of medieval and modern pilgrimage, relicking and souvenirring should also include, of course, the models of the Holy Sepulchre that were produced in the Holy Land in the 17th century and with which we began our event this evening. Now, I don't intend to say much about these models here and now, not least because uh, Rosie Weech has written an excellent essay about them on our project website, which I would strongly encourage you to visit uh, and read. Now, the, the, the URL for the specific page is at the bottom there. You also have the URL on your bookmarks and pencils, so please keep those safe and you can go home uh, and read Rosie's really interesting essay. Now, as Rosie notes uh, here, the fact that the Museum of the Order of St. John has three of what is estimated to be around 30 known surviving examples is just another indication of the riches within the museum's collections. One of the features of these models that is particularly striking is the printed Latin inscription that is pasted to the inside of the dome of the rotunda. And this calls upon readers to meditate on the Holy Sepulchre as a place that reminds the faithful of the sacrifice Christ made for mankind. And again, you can go to the website and you can see Rosie's translation 
of this passage there, uh, which interprets this uh, for a modern audience. And above this inscription, this is a detail I think is wonderful, it's an image of five early modern pilgrims approaching and venerating what is inevitably an empty tomb. So they enter through this little doorway here, and then you can see them uh, venerating before the sepulchre itself. There appear then to be a number of parallels and continuities between medieval, early modern, and late modern expressions of devotion to the Holy Sepulchre. But returning to the title of my lecture, this begs the question whether there was anything distinctive about Latin Christian devotion to this empty tomb at the time of the First Crusade. Now, in some respects, the answer to this question is self-evident. For in the last decade of the 11th century, Latin Christians did something they had never done before. They went to war for the Holy Sepulchre. The First Crusade represented an extraordinary fusion of long-standing traditions of Jerusalem pilgrimage with more recent and more radical ideas of penitential warfare. Simply put, the Crusade offered the arms-bearing classes of Western Europe an opportunity to gain remission of sins through the performance of acts of violence. The goal of the expedition was the reconquest of Jerusalem and the Holy Land from what Latin contemporaries perceived to be the tyranny of Islam. This was a profound devotional undertaking, at the centre of which was the desire to re-establish Christian custody of Christ's empty tomb. In the various narrative histories that were composed following the expedition's conclusion in 1099, devotion to the Holy Sepulchre was identified as having been one of the key factors in stimulating recruitment to the Crusade. According to one writer, the instigator of the Crusade, Pope Urban II, had made the following declaration in his call to arms in 1095. Most especially, let the Holy Sepulchre of our Lord the Redeemer move you in the power as it is of foul races, and the holy places now abused and sacrilegiously defiled by their filthy practices. Set out on the road to the Holy Sepulchre, deliver that land from a wicked race, and take it for yourselves. These sentiments were echoed by Robert's contemporary, Guibert of Nogent, who had Urban II declare, O oh, my dearly beloved brothers, you must exert yourselves with all your strength and with God leading and fighting for you, to cleanse the holiness of the city and the glory of the tomb which has been polluted by the thick crowd of pagans. And 50 years later, in 1145, Pope Eugenius III commemorated the achievement of the First Crusade, recalling how men from beyond the Alps and also those from Italy, fired with the ardour of love, assembled. And once a great army had been collected together, not without much shedding of their own blood, but attended by divine aid, they freed from the filth of the pagans that city in which it was our Saviour's will to suffer for us and we, where he left us his glorious sepulchre as a memorial of his passion. Following the Crusader conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, the commitment of Latin Christendom to the ongoing defence and security of the holy places is evident from the establishment of a new Latin kingdom of Jerusalem, about which you can learn more in the museum's galleries downstairs. The continuing significance of the Holy Sepulchre to the Jerusalem crusading project of the 12th century is evident from, among other places, the prominent position it was given on the kingdom's coinage. So here, uh, a coin of King Amalric uh, from the 1160s, early 1170s, we see a, the conical dome of the Holy Sepulchre. The centrality of the Sepulchre is also obvious from the manner in which subsequent calls for new crusades were composed. For even when new expeditions were preached in response to military disasters that had occurred hundreds of miles away, it was still Jerusalem and the Holy Sepulchre that were identified as the particular sites that were under threat from the so-called counter-crusade. 
I began this lecture by quoting a story told by one Cistercian monk, Caesarius of Heisterbach. And I'd like to close by quoting the words of another, Nicholas of Clairvaux, one of the secretaries of Abbot Bernard, who in April 1146 was assisting with efforts to secure recruitment for what we now know as the Second Crusade. And this is what he wrote. The earth is troubled and shaken because the king of heaven has lost his land, the land where his feet have stood. The enemies of his cross are working to destroy the places of our redemption, and they are straining to profane the places sanctified by the blood of Christ. The most important of these places for the Christian religion is the sepulchre, in which the Lord of all was buried, and where his funeral shroud was bound together. All of these things they are striving to pull down. For Nicholas, as for so many of his contemporaries, the crusade presented an opportunity for Latin Christians not only to express their devotion by fighting for Christ, but also by waging war for his empty tomb, the Holy Sepulchre. In this respect, study of the crusading period of the central Middle Ages provides us with insights into some of the continuities and parallels between medieval and modern devotion to sacred objects and spaces, but it also underscores something of the otherness of medieval Christianity as well. Thank you very much.